just have to share with you that this week is the session of which God has spoke most directly into my life. It's the area of which that I've needed the most work. And so it's about managing time and how that can be tricky and difficult. You know, as a wife, a daughter, a mother, a sister, an aunt, a grandma, leaders, um, we all often struggle with how do we get it all done? How do we manage it all? You know, some of us probably, uh, we think that people are always seeking our time. They're always coming and that our lists never get shorter. They're just continually added to. Um, that we never, never get closer to completing all the tasks that are required of us. You know, some of us have probably become pretty proficient at uh, balancing or mul uh, multitasking, I guess you could say. And, doing laundry and meals and taxi driving and in this COVID season, teaching lessons online and, you know, various things that we have to do um, with, our, with our schedules and the things that happen. So today's lesson is really about how do we do that? How do we figure out how to manage uh, in an effective way that is God-centered? Um, so I would just ask this question of you because this is a question that God asked of me. Has there ever been any area of your life that you feel pretty confident in? Your job, as a wife, as a parent, as a financial steward, as a student, teacher, Bible leader? Well, for me, God asked me that question and immediately time management came to my mind. It's something I've worked on all my life. It's something I started out very young figuring out ways to control and manipulate time in ways to manage it, to keep it under control. Um, I would uh, invest this into my classroom instruction and taught my students how to do it. Uh, I, it has even spilled over now into vacation planning. Um, <laughs> this concept of time management, you know, it's just something I've always been attracted to because I want to maximize these organizational methods that other people had, and so I would seek them out so that I could streamline my own processes that you know I needed them to be. So, confession day, again. Um, so, you might know, some of you may know me, you may know that I use tabs a lot. There's actually, this book is a Bible study video notebook that has three different studies in it. And how can you tell there's three studies? Three right? Three different kinds of tabs. Well, you know, there aren't enough tabs in the life of Libby to, to manage everything. So I have them all sizes. Oh, there's my name tag. All sizes and shapes. <laughs> Sorry, there's a squirrel. Name tags, you, uh, all kinds of sizes and shapes, but that wasn't enough. You know, now I go to highlighters of all colors, colored pencils with colored lead so that I can figure out what's most important and then mark it and, you know, hope to satisfy myself, okay? So all those things came about. Well, then, very proud of this little nugget. Um, this is a vacation binder <laughs> for last year's vacation out west. It was an 18-day RV trip uh, in which we saw 23 national parks and or historic sites in those 18 days. And you might say, oh my goodness. Uh, you might look and see, oh yeah, there's maps. There's an itinerary for every day. <laughs> there's pre-purchase tickets. There's things that I would collect and things I'd download along the way. This kind of thing took a lot of my time. It took hours and hours, months and months. And some of you are looking at this and you're saying, wow, I can really appreciate that. I understand that the, the detail that's in that. I appreciate it. Others of you are looking at this and you're saying, you're wondering why in the world <laughs> would anyone spend this much time on planning a vacation? Uh, you know, some of you would think, well, let's just take the fun all out of the vacation. Some of you are looking at it and you're saying, 
that's a little controlling, <laughs> a little obsessive, a little over the top, and you'd probably be right. Some of you, if you had the thought of just having to do this, it would take so much stress, so much stress on you that you would just say, I'm not going on vacation. <laughs> right? But for me, it's something that I enjoy, something I really took an interest in and an investment in. And I'm talking about a lot of investment. And some people in this room have actually borrowed some of my vacation notebooks and benefited uh, from uh, my planning and obsessive planning that kind of goes in there. But did you notice, did you catch when I introduced that, that it was my notebook? See, God whispered a couple of questions to my heart um, through this process and, and developing this study. And they were very, I love that God does this. He asks us innocent questions that cause us to really reflect and think. So his questions were, Libby, are you the only one going on vacation? Are you the only one whose input or opinions matter. E. See, what happens when my plans don't work out? What happens when our plans for our life don't work out? Are we disappointed? Are we upset? Can we even see um, some times when there's interruption or redirection or stopping of our plans. Can we see that maybe possibly God is using that to prevent something harmful or hurtful in our life? That by allowing the disappointment, the time of sadness or even anger, that God just might have something better in mind for us? Something of more substance something of more value, something that might be life-changing or eternal in mind. So I just ask, as he asked me, you know, how do we respond when God's plans are different than our plans? Do we respond with curiosity? I wonder what God's up to. Do we respond with gratitude? Oh, I'm so thankful for whatever God has planned? Do we respond with anticipation? I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Now, for some of you, sometimes maybe you ask those questions. For me, no. My response was disappointment, resentment, disillusionment, sadness, depression, bitterness, and sometimes anger. That was my first response. See, there was a time in my career when I felt like God was calling me out of the classroom. I was I retired educator. I taught for 26 years in the public education and then another in um, teaching around the state five more years. Um, but anyway, I felt like he was calling about my 16th year, I think. He was calling me out of the classroom into what would be, I thought, leadership, a leadership position. I just felt like there was an, a, a call that had happened, and it had been happening for a while, and so I obeyed. I sought out the training that was required, the schooling. I invested the money that would be required. I uh, got the leadership degree, a specialist in, in uh, administration. Then I went and sought out um, positions for a principal. Uh, I applied with applications. I had interviews, etc. but with every no came disappointment. And honestly, a feeling of rejection. I took it personally. I didn't understand. Questions began to appear. Did I hear God right? Had I sought the wrong thing? Why was this not working out the way that I thought it needed to work out? And that I thought it should. But see, with every door that closed, God opened wide open another opportunity to lead in a different way. 
Yes, an education, but in a way that would be very different than what I imagined. See, it was in that very same year when this opportunity came and I took the job that God already knew I was going to need a more flexible schedule to serve a son in crisis. He had been working behind the scenes the whole time and had provided for me a plan that was so much better than what I could have ever asked for. See, the problem was, yes, I heard God's plan, his calling on my life. He was calling me out of the classroom at just the right moment. But then I plunged ahead with my own expectation, my own idea of what that would look like. Never once consulting again along the way. Which then led me, what? To my disappointment, my rejection, my feeling of confusion and hurt. See, in Isaiah 42, 16, I love this scripture and it's meant a lot to me. Um, it says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. You see, God is saying that he will lead the blind by ways that we have not known. And I would say, you know, at the time I looked at them as disappointing ways, discouraging ways. But in reality, they came to be encouraging ways, faith-filled ways, honoring ways, ways of blessing. See, God can lead us in so many ways that we are blind to, that we don't even know are possible or can even think of. See, sometimes we get to see it later, like I have, which is a huge blessing to go back and reflect and see where God was the whole way. But I think there are times when we may not get to see the result of that until eternity. And we're just going to have to trust him with it in that regard. See, God also says in this scripture that he will turn the darkness into light. See, I think often we don't even know we're walking in darkness. In that idea of a self-centered desire, independent thinking, negative attitudes, hurtful speech, bitterness, we don't know until God shines his light on it, his life-altering light on those situations in our life. Sometimes by just simply asking a question. And I would ask, are we looking for the light? Are we looking it for the light that Jesus has in, and God has in the management of our time? Because God can shine lights in places that we don't know we need light shown. See, when we leave God out of our plans, he's disappointed, he's sad. And we will miss out on the better things when he is not invited and that he wants to give us if we will just invite him in. You know, I used to work, uh, watch a game show and I think it's still on. It's, it was called Let's Make a Deal. Monty Hall was the, was the host, uh, the MC or whatever, uh, years ago. And uh, I think Wayne Brady, maybe it's still is going on. I don't watch it anymore. But I used to get a kick out of just the crazy costumes and the way that people would dress just ridiculously so that they could be picked as a contestant and then they'd be called down to the front and be shown a known prize. They'd be given something that they could see that they knew in their hands they could take away. They could walk away with it. And then the host would offer them something that was hidden and uncertain. It could have been in a box, it could have been on stage, behind a curtain, etc. You know, what I remember a lot about that is, uh, you know, they would have to give up what they had and they knew for something unknown and uncertain. And often it was a, you know, $200 for a donkey or uh, they wouldn't get anything, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I believe that Satan is a master deal maker. You know, he's crafty. He constantly is tempting us to trade the prize we already have Yes, in Jesus and our salvation, but also in our God-given time. He wants us to trade it for worldly things, for things that are 
shiny on the stage for the things that maybe have hidden consequences and sometimes a lifetime of regret. But ladies, we don't have to, we don't have to, we don't have to make a deal because we really have the best gift already. It's known. There's no other gift out there that's going to be better than the Jesus that we serve and that has come for our salvation and the time that God has given us to use for his purpose. So we don't have to trade. And I would just ask, what, what would happen if we invited God into our plans, into the way that he will guide us before we plan, in the middle of, which I didn't do, right? In the middle of the plan, and then reflect back over and see God's hand through all of it. And then maybe adjust as well at the end of a plan. That may all be ha happening. So God has given to me a couple of uh, God-guided time management helps, if you will. And the first one is just simply set priorities. And they have to be something that we will reevaluate what really truly matters to us. Because where we spend our time is where our heart is. We can say it with our mouth, but where we actually do is where our heart is. And I have begun to look at what is kingdom worthy time spent. So in the things that I'm doing, is it kingdom worthy? And that means in anything I see, in anything I do, the things I'm letting coming into the filter of my heart and my eyes and my mind, is it kingdom worthy? And if not, it should prick my spirit and I should not be doing it or seeing it. In my parenting and grandparenting, talking with my children, my grandchildren about God, letting them see my investment in my relationship with Jesus, and then explaining why. Why is it so important to me? Hopefully, it will be important to them. You know, in our friendships, ladies, in other relationships, are we spending time in a way that honors God in them? and glorifies him as we work because we should be doing it for his glory you know in our honesty in our integrity in the way that we carry ourselves and sometimes we're asking our jobs to do things that do not reflect God and we're going to have to take a stand against that and set a priority to do what God asks us to do not what the world wants us to do and that means even in our ministry, sometimes we're going to have to give up our preferences for his purposes. It's not about us. So we want to set priorities. The other thing is we really truly need to deeply consider the where, the when, the who, and the how we spend our time on. This will prevent us, if we're, we're doing that, it will prevent us from really perceiving that we are wasting time. See, one of the greatest things that God has given me in this study for myself personally is that I understand I want to invite him into every part of my life, everything that I do, everything that I take part in. And one of the other things that he's shown me is I've got to slow down, right? Slow down and seek his will for my seconds, my minutes, the days, the weeks, the years, He's shown me that the value of just being still, and I'm going to tell you, do you know how hard it is for a type A over planning person to just sit still? But I've seen the blessing that comes from the stillness, even while preparing this study. Because it's in the stillness that we can feel God's presence more powerfully. It's in the stillness that we hear God's voice more clearly. It's in the stillness that we find true peace that only God can bring. And it's in the stillness that we will grow closer to him. See, if we're always busy, if we're always doing, if we're always planning, how do we have quality time for him? Sometimes we just need to be still. So two practices that I'm going to give you to help you with this that God has shown me is first of all, you got to build margin in your day. For somebody that never did that, because if there was a space, I was going to fill it. Professional filler here. 
But we need to allow God to be in those places and the Holy Spirit to guide us through into and through his purposes for the moments that we have, the days that we have, the people that he wants us to have in our life and for the situations that we'll, we'll take part in. So I know the question comes up, well, how much time is that? How much time does it need to be? I don't know. Ask God. Some days it may be more. Some days it may be less. But if we build in margin, it allows for the ways that God wants us to serve to happen. One such situation happened. Um, it was a day where I had built in some place, right? And uh, I'd say lo and behold, but no, God had it planned. Uh, a friend that I hadn't talked to for a very long time, she called and we talked. I don't talk on the phone long. I just tell you, I don't. It's usually yes, uh-huh, fine, all right. That's, that's where I'm not a talker on the phone. But we spent, I spent probably about 40, 45 minutes listening. Now, if I'd not had margin in my day, and I would tell you it was a blessing. It was a blessing to me, and I hope it was a blessing to her. Had I not had that margin in my life, I would have probably been rushing her to get off the phone and so I could go on with my busyness and the things I felt like were important. So if we've got margin, it allows for those phone calls from people. It allows for the drop-bys that people need. It allows for you to provide a meal or a batch of cookies to a neighbor or a friend. It allows for us to stop and offer our heart sometimes to just people that are needing us. So margin helps us to see the lost, the hurting, the desperate that cross our paths, that God di divinely appoints us. See, if our time isn't surrendered to God and some space provided in our day, there will be no margin. So provide margin. Put it in. It's going to be one of your challenges this week, by the way. And second, this is something I don't think any of us are good at. I certainly was not. We've got to learn to say no. Okay? No is not always accepted. It's not accepted sometimes by our parents, by our friends, by our peers, by our bosses, by our children, by our church. But we need to learn to say it. You know, one of the, uh, and, and God has brought this back to me as well, <clears throat> because I was notorious, again, time filler. I was always doing and filling and responding and not saying no. But um, my husband and I are big do-it-yourself project people. So we put in flooring and sheetrock, and one of the la later things that we did was to put backsplash in our kitchen tile, the backsplash of that. And so it turned out really well. First time we've ever done it. And my sister called, and she had come up, and she wanted to look at it. So she did, and it's like, oh, could you come do that for me? And so I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, I think I can do that. I'm masterful now at running the tile saw. And, measuring and doing all those things because I've done it now. So I went down and yes, and she was gonna help me and she did. Uh, but then the next thing I know, I've been voluntold <laughs> to do another friend's backsplash. And I'm thinking, what have I done? Maybe I got myself, did I wanna do it? No. So why do we do the things that we don't want to do? Right? Is it out of guilt? Is it out of peer pressure? Is it out of trying to please other people? Is it out of love? I don't know. Is it out of ego, pride? And it doesn't matter if we're painting or, or serving in some way, whether we're going on a mission trip. See, I think a better question is, do we, are, are we asking, you know, how do I say no? When do I say yes? I think a better question is, who do we want our life to please? Paul tells us in Galatians that this desire to please others will be difficult. In Galatians 1.10, he says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, knowing who we want, our life 
To please helps really guide our time to be spent in meaningful, kingdom-centered ways. This idea of saying no, Jesus gave us an example. So, you know, it's something that's acceptable to the Lord. In John 7, 6 through 9, it's when Jesus is talking with his disciples and they are trying to get him to go to the Feast of Tabernacles or otherwise known as the Feast of Booths. It's at the end of the harvest season when they're gathering and bringing in their food and they're to celebrate the goodness of God. Uh, Jesus says to them, My time is not yet, for you any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. See, Jesus wasn't surrendering to peer pressure. He knew that was not the moment. That was not the desired time. That was not where he was supposed to go then. I will tell you in John 7, 10 and in 14 that he did go after the disciples went. See, they were going to show him off. They were going to try to push this idea that other people would know who Jesus was and maybe rush the idea of him being the king. Um, and Jesus says, no, it's not the time. So he did go up to the feast later, but he didn't go publicly. You know, he went privately. And then later in the festival, we, we learned that Jesus, in the middle of it, he went to the synagogue and he began to teach, which was really what his purpose was was the main purpose. So he knew what he was supposed to be doing. And then again in Mark 1, we see it again where Jesus, the disciples are, they're healing many people. But Jesus says, I need to stop this healing. I need to say no to these other people because we need to move on to the other villages and towns around so that I can teach. And so why did he say no? Well, three things. He knew his time was very limited. So was ours, lady. It's very limited. He knew that his purpose was more than being a miracle worker. So we need to think about what is the many purposes that God may have for us? Not just the one I'm currently doing, what are they? And he also knew that the good should not eclipse the best. See, healing all those people were good. It was good, but it wasn't the best thing that God needed him to do. So we need to think about that. So every time that Jesus said no, it was to preserve the yes that he had for the Father. <clears throat> so ladies, managing our time definitely can be tricky. It will be hard. But Jesus tells us in John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. See, Jesus is telling the disciples here that they, the spirit is coming of which they will, it will help, he will help to guide all believers. That goes for us too. So if we want to know the where, the when, the how, and the why we're serving, or the yes and no, we have to ask the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5, it talks about us walking by the Spirit. So what does that mean? What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Well, first, I think it says every day we have to go to the Spirit. We have to ask the Spirit, where to invest our time and where not to. 